And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elaine. Hi, everyone. Just to start things off um, and have a little icebreaker, we have a couple polls um, just to get familiar with everyone's experience uh, working with food, don food donors on and off campus. Um, I'm just gonna launch our first poll. So the first thing we'd love to know is um, what is the state of your chapter's food recovery program this semester? So is it operational at all this semester? Is it operating in a limited capacity? Are you not able to operate? Um, awesome. So it looks like everybody has responded. Awesome. So it looks like um, we have kind of a mixed bag it says that 60% of people are operating in a limited capacity this year. Um, just 10% of responses are that your chapter is not able to operate at all. And then 30% of people said that their chapter is fully operational. So it looks like we've got a good mix of things. Um, we heard before this semester started that 75% of our chapters intended to record to recover food this academic year. Um, but we know that a lot of people have been facing challenges to do so. Um, for example, there's been a lot of challenges that chapters have faced with getting in contact with their dining services, um, whether that's because there's been staff turnover or they just lost contact with the dining services during the pandemic. Um, and a lot of partner agencies are no longer accepting prepared foods or having other operational changes that have um, caused difficulty for chapters. So I'd love to hear if anyone in this call has experienced any barriers like that this year. Um, and feel free to go off mute or to drop an answer in the chat if that's something your chapter has experienced. Hi, I yeah, I can get started. Um, so fun fact, we actually are operating with less donors than our pandemic era, which is quite surprising. And a main reason for that was um, we had four donors in the pandemic, um, but we lost all of them just before the semester because of changes in their management. Uh, quite a bad luck considering that all of their uh, changes happened at the same time. So we basically had to restart those relationships and uh, we got two of them back uh, after like contacting them and pestering them for a month, visiting them in person. Um, and the fact that the great resignation or so-called in quotes that's happening on right now is not helping either because I, from what I've experienced so far, uh, uh, the donors, especially uh, cafes and restaurants are experiencing staffing issues. So their main goal right now is to get staffing done before they can talk about like donating and basically they just don't have time for us right now. Yeah, that's definitely um, something we've heard from a lot of chapters is that the dining staff is just too short staffed to be able to have the capacity for food recoveries, which is really challenging. Does anyone else have anything they want to share? Yeah, I have a little story to share. Um, I have been struggling with the administrative side of my school. Um, there were like certain guidelines set out by like previous board members. So like our uppermost, uppermost board members graduated in that semester that COVID began. And so like as they were exiting FRN, they were also graduating. So we never really got a full debrief of like, this is what you need to do fall semester. Um, so like, of course I was meeting with them and like we went through all the documents that were left um, and did all the checklist things still. And then um, I was in contact with like two people of the same department of UMass. Um, and one of them like got our bags together for us because our bags were left in a dining hall that was totally like taken down and rebuilt through the pandemic. Um, and she was like incredibly supportive of getting our bags, getting us up and running, getting our trainings together. Um, and then um, my training was messed up because of just like, I also work for the school and like the database that we put our trainings in was just catered towards employee only, not student. So anyway, I emailed somebody about that and they came back at me with, you actually need this, this, and this training. And they are serve safe trainings that we usually do by the December of each fall 
semester. And in the meantime, we do these environmental health and safety trainings for the school. Um, and then like 24 hours before our first recovery is supposed to begin, I got an email from this person saying, actually, you need the surf safe training, which cost $180 to do um, outside of the school and doesn't run within the school until December. And yeah, so it kind of like figuring that out and it's been really challenging, but also I'm just trying to like take notes to do it right by the school so we don't get in any murky waters with them at all. Um, so that the next, I'm a senior. So going into the next fall is smooth. Uh, but anyway, we will be up and running for next semester. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. That's really challenging. That's definitely um, a common problem with just like the transitionary period as people are graduating during the pandemic and information just gets lost in the mix. Um, I will note FRN has a partnership with a company called Always Food Safe, um, which isn't the same as Surf Safe, but they are um, like a similar industry standard for food safety training. And so we have, um, I think it's the food handler certificate. Um, and we can give you an access code to complete that training for free. Um, and anyone in our network can take it for free. So um, you might be able to bring that to your dining staff and offer taking that instead of Surf Safe, that would help. Yeah, that sounds really awesome because we did have like a food handler training um, that we always did through the school. Um, and it's like I couldn't reach a compromise with this person. So I will definitely email her with that information and see, see if that'll do it in the meantime. For sure. Good luck. Awesome. Yeah, so that was always food safe. Um, and if anyone's interested in learning more, you can definitely shoot us an email at programs at food recovery network dot org. Um, and Aaron, if you wouldn't mind to drop some info in the chat as well. We also got a comment. Um, one issue is that we, or our issue is the regulation at our dining halls and restaurants has been very dynamic and continually changing. It's been really difficult to get a consistent recovery going. Yeah, so that's been really hard with all the turnover with dining services. Definitely a common issue for chapters. Awesome, well, I'm gonna bring us along to our next poll question. Um, so our next poll is, does your chapter work with a food donor off campus? Um, yes, no, or I'm not sure. Um, so it looks like we've got most of the results in. Um, and right now it says that 78% of chapters do not and 22% of chapters do. So definitely majority of chapters are not working with food donors off campus. So if you did answer no to that question, um, if you have any questions that you want to ensure that we answer today about working with food donors off campus, um, please share that in the chat or take yourself off mute in a second. Um, and then for those who answered that, yes, your chapter does work um, with an off-campus food donor, do you have any advice that you'd like to share with our chapters that are interested in working with off-campus food donors? And you can also drop that in the chat or take yourself off mute. Yeah, so I can talk about that. Um, so my chapter, I'm from California State University in Northridge, and I'm currently the president of Food Recovery Network. And right now we're doing um, off-campus recoveries with Pete's Coffee. And then also one of my officers works at a mall. Um, she works at a pretzel place called Auntie Anne's. So um, her manager also allowed her to do food recoveries. And she will also be reaching out to like other restaurants in the food court at her mall. So um, kind of just like a tip if you guys want one is there's a bunch of like times where you would have to call a lot of restaurants or bakeries depending wherever you want to recover. And I just kind of explained to them like the mission of Food Recovery Network and um, just how like food insecurity has increased um, due to COVID and the amount and just like gave them facts about um, food waste. So then that kind of got them thinking like, oh, wow, like I never realized like how much food waste there was and like how many individuals are dealing with food insecurity. So we found that I think that's really helpful when trying to find off-campus donors. Um, and obviously you will get restaurants in a lot of places um, that say no to you, but you can just like keep trying other <laughs> restaurants and bakeries as well. 
Definitely. Thank you for sharing. And I think um, if your chapter does have any connections, um, like Megan was sharing with her chapter member who works at the Auntie Anne's, um, if anyone in your chapter works at a local restaurant or just has those personal connections, that's always a good place to start with um, your outreach to off-campus food donors. And there's a comment in the chat. We work exclusively with off-campus donors as of now because college dining services have been very inconsistent to work with. Yeah, I think that's something that some chapters have experienced that it's been easier to establish those relationships off campus. There's definitely, I think a trend with um, smaller restaurants and farmers markets and that kind of thing. Like the smaller scale the food donor is, the more they can set their own rules. Um, whereas for your on-campus food um, dining services, they might have more like strict regulations they have to follow. Yeah. And actually, if I can add a quick tip for those who are wanting to explore off-campus options, um, we often ask our uh, club volunteers or club members um, if they work in any like restaurant or cafe around campus, because that's always a good way in to that place. And also, um, we always keep on going in person because e email just does not work. We never get a response. And if we call people up, they just be like, okay, just email us and we'll look into it. So our best option has been to like, just go in person, maybe like three or four times until we get a face-to-face -face with the manager. And um, once we get a response from the manager, then uh, we can move from there, whether it's a positive or an, excuse me, or a negative response. Definitely, that's really good advice, yeah. Hardest to say no when you're face to face with someone, I think. Awesome. Well, if anyone else has any ideas um, that you'd like to share, feel free to comment those in the chat. Um, but I'm going to move us on to our presentation section today, just in the interest of time. Thanks so much, everyone, for sharing. That was really helpful and great. And I think we'll circle back to some of those ideas as you know, Elaine and I move through uh, this presentation portion um, of the conversation today. And again, to reiterate, like Elaine said, feel free to continue posting like comments or thoughts, um, advice into the chat for everyone too. Um, so working with food donors off campus. Uh, so again, I just wanna remind you all that um, we've updated our guide to food recovery and this walks you through different stages of establishing a food recovery program. And some of it might feel repetitive uh, if you've you know, been in charge of getting that process up and running on your campus. But I think it's good to kind of go back to the basics <laughs> when you're thinking about starting a new relationship because there might be some nuances or some ideas in there that are a little bit different um, that you might want to take advantage of. So definitely recommend that you use it as a tool um, continuously. And I know that we'll kind of highlight some different areas of the guide uh, just to help inform our conversation about how to work with food donors off campus. Um, and again, you can just apply this information to support your chapter's goals. Um, so we're just going to walk through some basic steps and talk about, you know, some common questions I think that folks have when they're starting this process. But of course, you know, if you have questions, definitely ask. <laughs> so uh, step one, I mean, you're thinking about starting a new relationship. How do you even know who to reach out to? Where should you begin your search? Um, my personal recommendation, just based on experience working through the Food Recovery Verified program, is uh, thinking about this in a few different ways. So one, approaching large food waste generators. So some of you are already working with your dining service providers. Colleges and universities are what I would consider to be a large food waste generator. They're just very big establishments that are producing a lot of food producing food on a mass scale to feed a lot of people, but we know that they're not actually feeding as many people every day that they are preparing food for. Um, and so some other examples of, you know, large food waste generators are grocery stores, uh, hospitals, hotels, uh, entertainment centers, like malls, if you're thinking about food courts. Um, and I know that Megan kind of touched on that with the Auntie Anne's pretzels. So uh, definitely all of these are, are opportunities where surplus food commonly occurs. So it's good to think about, you know, impact, 
how can we recover the most food? These are some folks to start with. Oh, and farms. I didn't mention farms, but if you are in a more rural area, there is so much food that goes to waste on farms, unfortunately, just because, you know, if it's labor or cost or it's imperfect produce, sometimes it's not worth the cost to the farmer to harvest. Um, and so in those situations, gleaning is a potential opportunity. Um, so that's, that's one way to think about it. Uh, the next way to think about it is like, if you're in a really tight knit community and there are values driven establishments that you know about, like companies that have, you know, a uh, some kind of like an indication that they care. They're doing something extra already to serve the community. They care about the community or they're like more community centric, like a local coffee shop, something of that nature. That kind of a business is already more inclined to participate in a program like this because they understand, um, you know, what the impact could be from a social standpoint and an environmental standpoint in your community. So I think approaching some groups that might be smaller but that really care about how they're interacting with the local community is a good idea. Um, and then I think like Viraj mentioned, personal connections. If you or any of your friends or family members work at you know, a local restaurant or even one of the, the kinds of establishments that I mentioned before, you know, utilize those connections to help get you in touch with the right person um, to talk about a food recovery program. Um, all of these are, you know, different pathways that you can take to start to think about who you might want to work with as a chapter. Um, but I think it's a good place to start when considering who you're even considering to connect with and to work with. Yeah, so then um, the second thing to consider when you're um, starting to look for an off-campus food donor um, would be partner agencies. So it's really important to keep a couple things in mind. Um, for example, it's important to think about which organizations in your community might be in need of surplus food. So if you can direct that surplus food to the partner agencies that need it the most, that's really important. Um, and it's important to think about like in logistical considerations, what's the capacity of your partner agency to accept uh, food donations? So for example, do they accept the type of potential food donations from a food donor? Um, like. Do they accept prepared foods? Are they able to accept, um, I don't know, like foods that they'll need to repurpose into meals or do they need things to be already um, packaged into meals? Um, so when I was a student, I actually worked with a chapter at Western Kentucky University. Um, and this was a really big consideration for us. We had a couple different food donors. So we would work mainly with on-campus, um, smaller cafes like um, Einstein Brothers Bagels um, and Subway. We also worked with the local farmer's market and one small farm. And so when we were um, considering where we were going to bring our food donations, we had a couple different partner agencies we worked with. And we always had to think about which partner agency was able to take, for example, if it was a large quantity of one type of produce from a farm, um, could all of those partner agencies take it or would it be overwhelming one partner agency? Um, and it's also important to think about open hours for your partner agency and when you would be accepting food donations from your food donor and making sure that those line up as well. Yeah, I think it's kind of like a, you have like your two lists of like food donors, partner agencies, and you're kind of like matching to see what works. <laughs> um, so I think once you, you know, establish that foundation, uh, knowing who you want to reach out to about donating and then knowing who the potential recipients can be, that's when you can really start to build your case for food recovery. Um, you know, it's all about, I mean, and I hate to say this, but kind of like marketing, <laughs> like how are you talking about the program that you want to establish? Um, are you giving a sense of like security to that food donor, uh, you know, being able to speak to liability protection, um, talking about your expertise in food safety? These are all different components that kind of go into that messaging to make sure that somebody feels, you know, confident um, and comfortable working with you and being a partner with you. Um, you know, being able to address those kinds of questions, I think, is really important. So just a few things to keep in mind when you're starting to have these conversations. Um, you know, introduce yourself and share your mission. Um, it could be as simple as, you know, we're a local volunteer group and we operate under a national level organization. 
uh, to help ensure that surplus food is donated to feed people in need. Or it could be something, you know, more tailored to your chapter at your school. Uh, however you want to package that, I think having like a succinct mission statement is important. Um, and then explaining the impact, you know, if you already have a sense of who could potentially benefit from this food in your community, I think that that is really important to highlight so that the organization knows like, oh, this is actually going to be something that would be meaningful to other people that are living in this area. <laughs> I think that's really special. Um, so you can talk about the community or impact or even the environmental benefit of donating food. Uh, and then, like I said, explaining the liability protection. And I think that everyone here should know that we have resources on our website um, under our student resources page. If you're not familiar, if you want the links to the uh, Bill Emerson um, Good Samaritan Food Donation Act, and that's the federal level liability protection for all food donors. Um, it protects them from liability when they donate surplus food in good faith to a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So as long as the food donor believes that the surplus food is safe to consume at the time that they're donating, and it's going to a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which is typically any food pantry, uh, food bank, or other type of community-centric organization that's feeding people, um, and you can always ask if you're not sure, uh, but they're covered from liability protection, and that's at the federal level. There's also state level protection uh, that mimics federal level protection in most states. Um, and I, I can recommend a link for you to check out the, the specific policy in your own state. It's um, if you're all familiar with Refed is the organization, but they're a great resource for data and statistics on, on food loss in the United States. Um, so they have a policy finder on their website. So if you just Google Refed food policy finder, it should pop up and then you can just search by your state. They have a whole list of the, the protections and it's really well laid out, very clear. Um, so I recommend kind of going in with both of those in your back pocket <laughs> when you start to have these conversations, um, just in case they have questions and share the information with them. Um, and then food safety. We kind of already touched on this. Uh, I'm very excited that, you know, Always Food Safe has offered this free, you know, accredited, professional level uh, food handler certification to our network um, because they're just so thrilled about the work that all of our students are doing. Um, so like I mentioned in the chat, I just posted a blog on our website about this. It has the code that you need to access the course. Um, so definitely check out the blog post. Um, and that's also, you know, in addition to the food safety resources that FRN provides. Um, so that's also Awesome. Um, so the next step would be um, planning your outreach to potential food donors. Um, so it's really important to be prepared when you go to talk to off-campus food donors um, and make sure that you're coming across um, professionally um, and making it clear that, um, that you'll be a good partner for them and reliable. Um, so it's important to think about what you wanna say when you're pitching a partnership um, and how you'll do it. So we, as we've been mentioning, um, are relaunching our food donor guide or our food recovery guide. And in our food recovery guide, we actually have a really detailed script and FAQ section um, that can help you practice and prepare and guide that um, conversation with potential food donors. Um, and there's a couple different ways, as we've talked about, that you can reach out to um, food donors. You can email them, call them, or visit them in person. Um, in my experience, I found that a combination of multiple or all of those methods with each food donor is most effective. Um, so when I have been able to establish partnerships with food donors in the past, I'll generally send them an email. Um, if I don't hear back from them, I'll call them, and then I'll also visit in person. Um, and I found the most effective combination has been working with people with whom I already had a personal connection, sending them an email beforehand so they were kind of prepared um, and aware of what the concept of food recovery was um, and how it would work with their establishment. And then I would go and talk to them in person and kind of work through all those logistics. Um, but it's important to practice beforehand, make sure that you're dressed professionally, um, and you can definitely partner up with other members of your chapter and um, go 
in groups um, because it's always helpful to have power in numbers. Um, and also it's great to have a follow-up if the potential food donor agrees to partner with you. It's really important to reach out to them and thank them um, and just thank them for their time, answer any questions they have. Yeah, and I think like oftentimes you'll get a no at first, but if you keep following up with folks, it might turn into a yes. So I would say be persistent. And it also kind of shows how much you care um, and that you're accountable. You're still, you know, circling back with them. You didn't forget. Uh, and that goes a long way when people are considering, you know, starting a new kind of partnership, especially one of this nature. Um, so some other things to consider when you're thinking about these kinds of partnerships is logistics and planning. Um, so, you know, thinking about What's the kind of schedule that your chapter is actually capable of committing to? Um, you know, when you're working with a new food donor, being very honest about what your capacity is. So like, let's say you guys are only able to do one food recovery per week um, instead of, you know, like five, let's say it's a grocery store and they're like, we need to pick up every day then. You're gonna have to be honest and say, we're actually only able to pick up on certain days of the week at certain times because of our schedule as students. Um, so I think being very clear about what your availability is. Um, and also, I mean, with that, like what kind of transportation do you have access to? I think that that's going to be another kind of logistical question that comes up. Um, and so if you're your chapter that lacks, you know, a personal vehicle um, in some capacity, start to think about what other kinds of options you might have. Um, if your school has vans that you can rent out or get access to to use on specific days when you know you're going to have pickups, um, if you want to invest in like a Zipcar membership um, or if potentially like other kinds of rideshare options are available to you, those are all kinds of things to think about. Um, I think even before you're going in to meet with these food donors, making sure that it would be the right fit for you and your chapter, you know, prior to reaching out and making that connection. Um, and then also thinking about, you know, how many volunteers you might need and how you intend to communicate with volunteers to schedule pickups. Let's say that it is a more complicated type of partnership where it's, you know, multiple days of the week, you need to pick up from this food donor and deliver to your partner agency. Um, you know, is it going to be a set schedule for everyone every week? Do you need to have some kind of like group text system where you're like, okay, Thursday, we need somebody to commit to pick up. Um, I think again, thinking about the accountability piece is really key. Um, these food donors are then counting on you and so are the partner agencies. So you wanna make sure that you're, you feel like you're covered and um, you've thought about some of these logistical questions in advance. And then once you've set up a partnership with an off-campus food donor, it's really important to think a lot about how you can maintain a strong partnership um, and keep the relationship really strong. Um, so definitely it's good to think about scheduling routine check-ins um, to provide and receive feedback. Make sure that the logistics that you have and the schedule you have in place is working out um, and that your visions for the partnership are aligned. It's very important to be accountable and reliable and make sure that um, as Aaron mentioned, like, for example, you're not over committing your chapter and then not able to follow through um, and that you're like just communicating well um, and just being really transparent with your food donors. Um, and it's important to proactively communicate if you experience any challenges. Um, and it's also important to think about recruiting and educating new volunteers so that you're able to keep that partnership going over time as the membership in your chapter changes and people graduate and move on. And I think um, one last note, it's really good to show your gratitude to your food donor um, for partnering with you and making sure that their extra food is going to people in need. Um, so it definitely goes a long way to write thank you notes and um, shout them out on social media and things like that. I love that, Elaine. I think that's so important. People always like to know how the program is actually impacting the community. So that's a great reminder. Um, and then, you know, sometimes we've touched on this already. People say no. <laughs> what happens if the food donors that you're reaching out to consistently say no? Um, I think one, make a note to circle back. Uh, on the slide, it says four to six months, but I think you can kind of decide based on the conversations that you're having with folks, what would be an appropriate time to circle back. 
if you even get somebody who gives a response like, hey, we're really slammed right now. All we can do is like survive our day to day. So I would love to do this program with you at some point, but it can't be right now. Ask them when an appropriate time to follow up might be. Um, and if they don't give you an answer, then I think you can kind of decide for yourself, like, okay, maybe in like three months, or if they're really struggling, go with the four to six. But I think it just depends on the business and, and what, the, um, what the situation might be. But either way, follow up, be diligent. And even if it's just like a, hey, I was just thinking about, you know, your business the other day, I walked past your store. Um, just wanted to touch base and say that, you know, I'm still available to have the conversation whenever you're ready about how to donate surplus food and leave it at that. Um, and then I think, you know, also consider if you really can't work with a food donor right now, you know, FRN National has some other opportunities for your chapter to continue to activate, even if it's not necessarily in the way that you planned. Um, one program that I am, you know, so jazzed about, I love it. I've been working with this group for over a year now, and they're amazing, um, is volunteering with the FarmLink Project. So this is another student-led organization that popped up uh, at the beginning of the pandemic in March, 2020. And these students were just responding to, you know, all of those articles that were popping up about food loss and food waste happening on farms specifically when, you know, the, the pandemic really, um, destroyed a lot of the supply chains that were, we had going. Uh, and so there, they took action, they organized really quickly and they scaled really quickly. So the FarmLink project in just a year and a half has donated more than 34 million pounds of food from farms across the country to local organizations, which is incredible. I mean, it's amazing. And actually some of our volunteers from our network have been a big part of that process to help support them. Um, so we host virtual power hours with the FarmLink project. And so we host either research hours or calling hours, but this is a virtual opportunity. You can join from anywhere. You could join as a chapter. Um, it's kind of fun when you have like a group of people. I actually just did a power hour with my sister and my partner. So we had a, we had a good time. Um, but essentially you're just joining an hour long Zoom call and you're either doing the research side of things or you're making phone calls. Um, if you're interested in just research, you can email me and I can I can send you the times for just research hours. If you're like, I hate cold calling, it's not for me. So that way there's no surprises. Uh, I can definitely get you set up for a research hour instead. Um, but I think it's such an impactful way uh, to engage because the potential for recovery is huge. Um, just one hour of your time can result in the donation of over 20,000 pounds of food, which is awesome. So think about if your chapter was giving, you know, 10 hours a semester, the impact would be massive. So highly encourage you all to get involved in that if you can. <clears throat> if not, other opportunities to still have an impact in your community. You could think about fundraising or volunteering for your partner agency if that's ultimately, you know, the group that we're trying to support through these efforts. Um, Think about, you know, what might be helpful to them and you can get in touch and reach out and say, hey, we'd love to be more engaged and involved in supporting your organization. Are there any opportunities for us to help like fundraise for you or um, especially now that it's like end of the year giving season is huge um, or even to offer, you know, a helping hand, especially around the holidays meal service really picks up. People are, are looking for that kind of support. And so it's a good time to kind of get engaged in a bigger way. Um, and then we also, you know, encourage you all to think about advocacy or hosting educational events for your campus or for your community. Um, if there's like a local food policy council that you can get involved with, you know, that's another big way that you can have an impact over time uh, by advocating for, you know, just different kinds of policies that can help promote access to food for the communities that need it most. Um, so just a couple of thoughts and ideas, things to think about if it's really not an option for you to work with a donor. So with all that, I would love to open it up to the group. Uh, do you have any questions or reactions, um, you know, for folks that already work with food donors? Is there something that we might not have covered that you think is important and you want to share with the group? I will leave it open. You can unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Yeah, I can start off. Um, I just thought that the PowerPoint presentation was had like a lot of really good tips um, for all of us. So 
I really appreciated that. And then I also really liked how Elaine talked about the gratitude because I never thought about to like post um, and like tag them on our Instagram about like the impact that they're having by allowing us to do food recoveries with them. So I'll definitely bring that up to um, my club, <clears throat> my club members and officers that we should start doing that as well. Cool. Well, I'll keep things moving. I have just a couple more um, slides to share with you all before I let you go, but we're very close. So thanks for bearing with us. Um, one, I do also want to just remind folks about our Food Recovery Verified program. If you do end up working with a food donor off campus, um, this is a cool option for them to be recognized in a national way. Uh, so through Food Recovery Network, food businesses can apply to um, receive our Food Recovery Verification, which just provides that recognition for their business for donating surplus food, uh, and they can, you know, be connected to our broader community of other food businesses that are donating um, from time to time. You know, we share different stories with them and, and reach out to share information about, you know, our programs and the work that our schools are doing. So it's just a cool way to expand people or expand our network and bring, you know, new people into this kind of a community. So if you're interested, um, you know, we have lots of information about the program on our website. So you can definitely check out more about the verification, what's involved, but it's pretty simple for folks to apply, especially if they're already donating. If they're not, um, they can always get in touch with us to figure out how to set up a program. But in this case, I feel like you all are taking on that role to help them set up a program, which would be great. So, um, and then I know we have one more poll. Elaine, I'll toss it over to you. Yes. So um, our last poll, we would just love to hear from you all. Um, so we are going to hold our next chapter leader call in early February, February, and we'd love to hear what topics you all would find most helpful for your chapter. So some different topics that we thought might be helpful um, include how to navigate chapter leadership transitions, how to structure your resume to reflect your work with Food Recovery Network, how to get involved with cleaning, how to plan an event or adv advocacy campaign with your chapter, um, how to host an end of semester food drive or other. And if there's anything else um, that you'd like for us to cover, definitely feel free to drop that in the chat or unmute yourself because um, we wanna make sure that all of our chapter calls are useful and in sharing information that you all are interested in. Um, before we go, I just wanna say, um, I really appreciate all the resources that you guys mentioned um, today. I know about a lot of them, um, but a check-in and seeing you guys is really nice. Um, I miss all the chaos going on out here. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, of course, Billy, and thanks for joining. And uh, if anybody has you know, more specific questions about your particular situation, which I know Billy years was a little bit different than you know what some other folks might be facing in terms of the challenges, you are always welcome to schedule a call with me and Elaine um, and we can help kind of problem solve for you in like a one-on-one -on -one capacity. So if you didn't feel like your questions might've been answered today, definitely hit us up um, you know, to schedule a call during another time. Yeah, sounds good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Elaine, how's the poll results coming? Doing well, um, it looks like we have a wide variety of interests. Um, so it looks like the thing that people are the most interested in is how to host an end of semester food drive. And then after that, how to navigate chapter leadership transition. And then we have an even split um, with how to structure your resume, how to get involved with gleaning and how to plan an event or advocacy campaign. So definitely awesome. good to know. Thank you all for sharing. Yeah, we'll definitely continue to pull folks. Um, and then I have two quick announcements and then we were out of here, everyone. So uh, one, end of semester survey. We are sending this out on the 30th of November and this is gonna go out to all chapter leaders. Um, this is a survey that we send out at the end of every semester, just for any folks who might not be familiar with this survey. Uh, it provides EFRA National with a lot of important information about our community. Um, we get a better understanding of who, like what students are actually in our network. Um, how your chapter is activating and how we can continue to refine and improve our programs to support all of you. 
Um, so feedback that you provide in that survey, you know, we take that in, we analyze it, and then that's how we're activating to change up our programming for the next year. Um, so it's, it's really amazing when folks can fill this out. We really only need one person from your chapter to complete it, um, but we will send it to all leadership team members that we have on our mailing list. So multiple members from your chapter might receive it. And we would just love for you all to, you know, connect with your chapter um, at the beginning of December to figure out, okay, who's going to tackle this? Do we want to tag team? However you want to do it is fine, but we would love to get that information from you all. Um, and then the other reminder is about food tracking forms, which is somewhat related to the EOS. Um, but if your chapter is recovering food this semester, please remember to submit a food tracking form. Uh, this form feeds into, you know, collective data that we have about how, um, like the big picture about our collective impact as a network. So the data, you know, we use this in a lot of different ways, but it's just so important for us to help demonstrate how pervasive food waste still is as a problem on a national scale um, and how diverting surplus food leads to better social and environmental outcomes. Um, the data is really what catches people's attention to start a new chapter on their campus or to support our new our movement in like other ways through, you know, fundraising or donations, um, things of that nature. So it just keeps fueling the fire to support our movement. Um, so it's, Really amazing when you all can help us out by reporting the data uh, that you're collecting about your food recoveries, and that way we can showcase it on a national scale. So two forms to keep an eye out for. Well, the food tracking forms on our website, you can fill it out anytime. The EOS will come to your inbox in November, at the end of November. Um, so that's all I have. If anybody has any additional questions for me or Elaine, you're welcome to stick around. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining. And it was so great to see everyone. Delighted to have you on the call tonight.